Hello and welcome uh, to this lecture entitled IT Themes and Trends. I'm Dr. Richard Ruth and I'll be uh, delivering some thoughts for you today on the themes and trends that are impacting the modern CIO. We surveyed a group of very successful CIOs several years ago and asked them uh, to tell us what are the most important things that a CIO needs to understand. High up on their list, I'm forgetting the actual position now, it's like the seventh or eighth most important thing for a CIO to understand, um, according to this group of CIOs, was what we called IT themes and trends. Um, historical trends and modern day themes that impact a CIO. So we want to talk to that today. Um, <clears throat> normally uh, professionals, CIOs, IT directors who hear this lecture get a lot of value out of it. So sit back, relax. Let's, uh, let's take a look at what I call um, a very brief and overgeneralized review of the history of IT. In the 1960s, and if you're really old like me, you can actually remember that. The rest of you will just have to take my word for it. In the 1960s, when computers were really starting to take a place in the corporate business world, for the most part, <clears throat> we were then sort of a priesthood of technical gurus. Um, we didn't have much understanding of how to use computers for a lot of different business applications. Uh, in the corporate world, initially, computers were used primarily just for payroll. Um, the top IT person was called the head of DP. DP was, back then, said for data processing, so we didn't even recognize that it was information yet. It was just data that we were moving from one place to another. And DP people were stereotypically viewed as techno-nerds. The computer facility that I had some interface with um, from the 60s was at a place called Command Nuclear, later renamed Command Sciences. Uh, it was a government uh, R&D private corporation that was headquartered in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Uh, and <clears throat> this, this company had two supercomputers, uh, both designed by a fellow named Seymour Cray. Uh, at that time he was working for Controlled Data Corporation, so we had these twin CDC 6400 supercomputers. Seymour Cray later left CDC and, and went to uh, start his own company called Cray Computers. So most of you know of Cray Computers. That's a, um, a fairly modern company that builds supercomputers. But Seymour Cray was initially doing this uh, under the auspices of Control Data Corporation, and we had a couple of these supercomputers at Command Sciences or Command Nuclear back then. <clears throat> they both sat in a raised floor, glass wall, environmentally controlled, temperature, humidity controlled um, computer room. And it was right off the front lobby because the company wanted lots of bragging rights. People walk in the front door, they want everybody to know, hey, we have a computer. Well, having a computer back then was a big deal. Only very large corporations could afford them. They generally cost on the order of a million dollars a piece. These CDC 6400s each cost, if I remember right, about five million a piece. So between the two of them, there's a $10 million investment. And that's back when $10 million was a lot of money. And what did, what, did you, what did you get for your $5 million per computer back then? Well, let me tell you, these babies had 64K of RAM. 
Now, we didn't, uh, no, I didn't misspeak. I didn't mean 64 gig or terabyte, 64K, 64,000 bytes or words, actually, is what they had. They were 60-bit words in the supercomputer. Um, <clears throat> we have the average word file today is bigger than that. The average Excel file is probably on that order. So, um, five million dollars, not a lot. And the, and the CPU cycle time on these, if I'm remembering right, was right on the order of one microsecond. Which, which is, what, thousands of times slower than the CPU on your cell phone today. Okay, so yes, computers have come a long way, um, <clears throat> but way back then we were wondering what would you ever need 64K of, we didn't call it RAM, we called it core back then, but it's the same thing as RAM today. What would you ever need that much space for? We didn't know, but it was there in case we ever needed it. Well, <clears throat> when you have a computer like that, that doesn't have much space, doesn't run very fast in accordance with today's standards, and certainly isn't connected to anything else. We didn't have the internet back then. Um, there weren't even LANs, but what would be the point of a LAN? Um, most companies just had one computer. There was nothing to connect it to. So what were computers used for for business? Payroll. Why payroll? Well, prior to the computer, payroll was done by a bunch of people with paper and pencil, running calculations, pulling little index cards out of shoeboxes with people's time card information on it, and, and doing a, a paper and pencil calculation to determine how much to pay this person this month. A um, lot of errors. The errors cost money, a lot of people, the people cost money. So we can reduce this very expensive overhead called payroll processing by buying a single computer. And if the computer costs a million dollars, yeah, that's a lot of money, but it's not as much money for a large corporation as paying for 40 different people who are full-time accountants just processing payroll. Not to mention, um, Whenever mistakes were made, it always seemed we were just underpaying people. We evidently never made a mistake overpaying people because those people never came in and said, hey, you paid me too much. So a lot of, lot of money being lost. And, and <clears throat> those errors were eliminated with the computer. So that's... But let me ask a question now. I want to I wanna build a little chart over here. And we're going to track the historical evolution of the CIO across the decades. We're starting here with the 1960s, and then we're going to look at the 70s and 80s, and 90s, and then uh, the 2000s. And I want, to, I want to map three different things as we move along here. <clears throat> the first one is the business impact and skill necessary for the senior IT person. Now, back in the 1960s, we didn't call these people IT people. The, I, the term IT didn't really begin to emerge until the 1990s. Um, but we're going to track business impact. In blue here, I'm going to track um, political skill. Political acumen, political skill. And in red, I want to track leadership skill. So the top IT person in our little group uh, at Command Nuclear, I mean, he was a techie. He was hired because he understood how to program computers. That's about all he knew, professionally. 
Um, and he hired a few other people, two or three other people, to help him with this task. So he was sort of a team leader, if you will, but not really a manager. Um, the, uh, the people that were working for him either thought the way he did and did things the way he did, or he replaced them and got somebody else. So there's not a lot of leadership going on there. And in terms of business impact, his, the expectation on him to contribute to the business bottom line of the company wasn't very big. He was just supposed to run the computer and do what they told him to do with the computer. All right, so <clears throat> when we look at business impact, if we consider this along the vertical uh, axis here, importance or degree of skill, not very big. And similarly, his political skill. How, how skilled was he at effective communication with the C-level executives in that corporation? And how, how, well was, was, how well did he influence them uh, to um, buy into his ideas on how to improve the corporate strategy? That wasn't happening. Okay, so that was nearly non-existent back here. And his leadership skill, we sort of just covered that. That wasn't very well developed. We didn't hire him because of his great leadership skill. We hired him because of his technical expertise. All right. So now we progress on to the 1970s. In the 1970s, we had the beginning of the emergence of mainframe computers as business systems. So all of a sudden we started discovering other things these computers could do. This notion of a database and database managers came into existence in the 1970s. And we started discovering you could use databases for all kinds of things. You could use a database for inventory control. You could use a database for tracking invoices, accounts payable, accounts receivable. You could use a database for um, all sorts of logistics needs. Well, production, scheduling, etc. So these became business systems. Um, at the heart of the business systems were these usually fairly good-sized databases, and the job of a database manager was born in the 1970s, and initially those people were fairly highly paid because there weren't a lot of them. They were specialized. The term information systems was born in the 70s. The top IT manager was now called an IS manager, so notice by the title we've promoted this guy. He's no longer just the head of something. He's actually got a manager in his title. Almost all IS managers used to be programmers, software developers, but they're still pretty much kept at arm's length by most business people. But the size of the IT shop, again, not yet called IT, uh, but the size of the IT shop back by the time we get to the late 1970s in the largest corporations in the country may have been 20 or 30 people. So we're starting to accumulate a lot of people. And the person who's responsible for that has had to improve his leadership skills some. So that's gone up a little bit over the last 10 years. Got more people to keep track of and motivate and manage. His political skill has also gone up some as he begins to build these applications for different parts of the business. He's got to go out and communicate with the guy who's in charge of inventory or the guy who's in charge of finance or the guy who's in charge of production. He's got to learn to, to start to learn to speak their language, um, understand their business needs so he can go back and get his people to design databases that will satisfy those needs and the systems around those databases. And his business impact is improving, if you will, or IT's impact in the corporation because it's no longer just doing payroll or one function that this company bought that computer for back in the 1960s, but it's now seeing lots of applications in lots of areas around the business. So let's pop into the 1980s now. 
In the 1980s, at the beginning of the 1980s, we had the emergence of PCs, early 1980s. At first, they were just a novelty. Mostly, we had spreadsheets and word processors, and that was about it. Um, and, but that was enough for people throughout a, a very large corporation to start to experiment with this, buy these things on their own, a lot of times without the knowledge of IT or the, the IT director. And they would put critical company business data on these things, or they would use them for correspondence, and, and the file systems for those correspondence started being kept on the computers. And these PCs weren't all that reliable back then. They would break fairly often. Uh, so the IT guy was getting calls from people all around the organization. One guy's got an Apple, the other guy's got a Lisa, the other guy's got an IBM PC, the other guy's got a Commodore 64, and the list goes on and on and on. All with their own proprietary hardware, software, data formats. Uh, and the IT guy's expected to support this stuff. Um, which was hard. I really don't envy the average IT director back in the 1980s. Um, one MIS manager I heard said, uh, I wish I could kill these PCs. They spread like kudzu. From those of you who aren't in the South, kudzu is a very rapidly growing uh, ivy-like vine um, that sooner or later just takes over everything and kills all of the vegetation underneath it will cover whole forests and fields and everything else that's not kudzu just gets killed. But they move very, it grows very quickly. In some cases it's been documented to grow as much as a foot a day um, in, t in terms of the length of this ivy vine. So the point here is that <clears throat> these IT directors were having their internal resources being stressed to the limit because of the proliferation of these multiple proprietary hardware and software systems. Um, so PCs were not a big plus for IT directors back in the 1980s. Um, some PCs were networked together, but usually not. Uh, and the understanding of how to use PCs for business advantage started growing as we moved through the 1980s. By the time we got to the end of the 1980s, it was evident that at least for many applications uh, in the business world, PCs were here to stay. Now, let's take a look. <clears throat> this uh, IT director for a Fortune 1000 class company, uh, by the time we get to the late 1980s, might have 50 or 100 different people in IT, or in some cases even more. Uh, so we've certainly seen his leadership ability or need for that skill to improve over that time. His political skill, yeah, he's now finding that in, in some very real and substantial ways, he's having to compete with resources, funding, personnel, prioritization issues with the business unit leaders throughout the company. Um, he probably spends way more time at this point in front of the CEO than he wants to spend in front of the CEO. Uh, but by necessity, his political skills have been improving and the impact on the business of information technology has uh, also been improving through that decade. Now I've divided the 1990s into two half decades. So the early 90s, uh, the internet began to emerge as something. Uh, we really didn't know what. Um, lots of different ideas on whether it was here to stay or a passing fad. Email started catching on as a required business tool. Uh, most white-collar people had a PC. Um, we started calling the head of IT an IT director 
in the late uh, 80s, early 90s, uh, people started to realize that interconnectivity could give them significant business advantages. Now, a lot of these are insights when we look back, we just want to kind of go, duh, who wouldn't have known that? Well, we didn't. Uh, they say that you uh, walk backwards into the future. Uh, we, we were sort of locked in on the paradigms of how business had operated, what IT's role was going to be from the previous decades, and, and weren't really understanding this dramatic cultural and business paradigm shift that was in progress around us. The second half of the 90s, uh, the internet was really catching on, the World Wide Web. Now, I know some of you um, might feel like correcting me at this point, the internet existed actually a couple de decades before this, initially called DARPANET and then ARPANET, but it was run by the government and only universities and um, large businesses that did business with the government and government agencies were hooked up to it. Uh, and it was a, it, the World Wide Web didn't exist until the early 1990s when Tim Berners-Lee um, was credited with developing that. It wasn't available until the late 80s, early 90s to the commercial world uh, in, in general. And so now businesses were hooked up by email to their customers and their vendors, their partners. Almost everybody in the white collar world now had a PC or a laptop or several. Uh, IT was seen as a strategic business force. Now that was actually a new business concept by the late 1990s. That information was a strategic business asset. That was really sort of a new thought. Uh, we were trying to figure out what to do with it, but we got the idea, we were getting the idea uh, that information might be a bigger deal than we had previously understood it to be when we were just looking at it as data. So the head IT person was now in larger corporations being promoted to the C-level in the executive suite. And so by the time we get to the end of the 1990s, we've seen the business impact of IT continue to increase. We've seen the political skill of the top IT person now needing to develop to the point uh, to where he is dealing with the other C-level executives as peers. And we've seen the need for his leadership skill to develop to the point to where in some corporations he's um, heading up an organization that's quite large and he has leadership obligations and responsibilities corporate-wide, not just inside IT. <clears throat> so this takes us into the 2000s. Now interestingly enough, in the 2000s there's an increasing number of CIOs not coming from IT. That's interesting. I have I have worked with and helped several CIOs who their very first job ever in IT was as the CIO. So they came from the business part of the business. They came from operations or they came from finance or they came from marketing. I've seen examples of all those. Um, why would that be happening? Why would you put somebody in charge of IT who's never been in IT before? I mean, these are, these are people whose complete IT skill sets may be limited to the ability to turn on their PC and, and write a Word document and send email. And uh, anytime they have to do something other than dial a number or check email on a cell phone, they gotta go get help. An increasing number of CIOs in this decade were becoming CEOs. Why would that be? Well, if the CIO is really functioning at the C level in terms of these skill sets, and also the CIO basically has his or her hands in all the different business systems of the company, all the different business processes, they're the ones with the broadest view, potentially, of all that's happening throughout the business, it might 
might make a lot of sense, and it does for a lot of companies, that when the CEO retires, the obvious successor to that job is the CIO. And an increasing number of CIOs are becoming not just players, participants in the business strategy planning process of the company, but they are becoming the leaders, the champions of business strategy planning. So what we saw happening with these lines as we moved in, in and through the 2000s is they continued to increase so that in many cases, <clears throat> they approached CEO level skill sets. Now what I have mapped here through these decades is a pretty aggressive progression of the necessary skill sets to be a competent CIO for a, usually what we're talking about at this point is a very large corporation. Smaller companies are farther back along this evolutionary chain. But what does this mean to you? Well, if you take a look at your company and you're looking at my description of what happened across these decades and you go, you know what, we're probably still like down in here somewhere, then you know what's ahead of you. You know that in order for you to progress career-wise, that you need to move yourself to where you can operate at this level across these skill sets. That's, that's an important understanding. <clears throat> also, let's, let's plot one more thing on this map. Let's plot what the, what the technical skill level was necessary to be the top IT person in the organization. So back in the 1960s, how important were technical skills for the top IT person to do his job well? Well, it was vital. That was why we hired him. That was his only job, was being technically proficient. So that was way up here. And if we map the, the evolution of the need for technical skill through these decades, we're going to be drawing a curve that looks something like this. So that for the very large, again, successful, aggressive corporations that followed this whole map through each of these decades, followed that march these decades, you look at the technical abilities of some of the most highly paid CIOs in the country today, and they don't have much. They're, they're not in their job because they're technical gurus. They're in their job because they know how to impact the business, they've got very good political skills, and they've got very good leadership skills. Um, and that's how somebody gets to sit in this seat in the larger corporations. And I, I think it should be obvious, that's what the future of all CIOs looks like. All right, <clears throat> so interesting realizations that we can take from this curve. Not only is this what your future looks like if you want to continue to progress professionally, assuming that you're not already functioning at this level, but it also helps you arrange your priorities in terms of those things you're going to spend your time getting better at. It's probably not in your best career interest to maintain proficiency in the information technology skill sets. That line's doing this in terms of how important it is to the company that you be smart about those things. Now I know some of you that have spent your whole career making sure that you are very technically competent will have a hard time with that statement. But let me assure you, some of the very best CIOs that I've seen, some of the CIOs that have done the best job in leading their IT organizations to create significant business impact for the corporation, have their very first job ever in IT was as a CIO. I've seen lots of examples of that. So 
as, as much as that might be hard for you to understand and as much as some of you, now, I was a technical guy, I get this. I get um, that letting go of what's been a very strong suit may be difficult for you to do. But the point is, it's probably in your way. It's probably impeding your progress career-wise to hold on uh, to advanced technical competence in a bunch of the areas that are in operation inside your IT shop. So what should you be concentrating on? Well, obviously this stuff. I mean, instead of reading Computer World magazine, you should be reading Forbes. Instead of reading um, technical bulletins or articles on the latest technical challenges facing cloud implementations or facing CRM systems or facing ERP systems, instead of reading that stuff, you probably ought to be reading things like Fortune magazine and etc. Um, political skill. Can't live without it. I also get that a lot of a lot of career IT people tend not to be as gifted and well developed in terms of political communication skills in the organization as maybe the sales guys or the marketing guys or the COO certainly the CEO, uh, but that has to be an area of your focus if you want to progress professionally. And leadership skill, same thing. Does the rest of the corporation outside IT perceive you to be one of their most effective leaders? If they don't, got a lot, a lot of room to grow there. Um, so. Those are, those are some of the takeaways that we can get from this diagram. So another implication from this diagram is if you determine that you're somewhere down here and you make the decision that you want to move into this space up here, as you begin to progress in the development of these skill sets, to make that jump, that may be at times a little disorienting to some of the other folks on the senior leadership team. You may start hearing comments like, what's the IT guy doing in this meeting? Um, or people may start wondering why all of a sudden you want to spend so much time talking about the intricacies of the business strategy and what the levers are, the business levers are in the company and how to use IT to pull those levers. Um, so I will tell you though by my experience there won't be nearly as much resistance as some of you might expect there to be. Normally you're going to find, although some of the other senior leaders might be a little surprised, uh, that you're now trying to operate at a much higher level in the company, but for the most part they won't be Disappointed at that, they'll welcome that shift. All right, if we go to the next slide here, um, I have listed six common areas of challenge, if you will, for a modern CIO. Uh, number one is dealing with something we call the commoditization of IT. Um, I will talk more to that in just a little bit. Then the whole issue around sourcing, um, which by the way is actually connected to the idea of commoditization of IT. Um, IT architecture and infrastructure is a very important strategic part of what the CIO has to get figured out. If you get the wrong architecture in place today, uh, that will impede your ability to be strategic in the future. InfoSec, probably more than any other item, is responsible for more CIOs these days getting invitations to seek employment elsewhere. If you don't properly address the information security challenge that faces uh, the information assets of your company, uh, then you can create huge liabilities uh, for the company, or at least it will be the perception of the leadership of the company that you're the one has created those liabilities. Uh, the business justification imperative 
Um, more and more CIOs are finding their feet held to the fire to uh, do good estimates of the internal rate of returns on large IT investments and then to actually deliver those internal rate of returns, those promised internal rate of returns. And then, as we have said, the CIO as the lead strategic business partner or champion for the corporation. So when we talk about the commoditization of IT, we start with the question, what is a commodity? Well, commodities are things like maybe nails at a hardware store, uh, gasoline that you put in your car, electricity running in the walls of your house. What makes a commodity a commodity is that there's basically no brand differentiation anymore between providers of that product. Uh, so for instance, when I go to the hardware store, or you go to the hardware store to buy uh, nails for some building project you might have on a weekend, um, you probably pay no attention at all to who the manufacturer of the nail is. You're buying nails based on packaging and price, and that's what, that's what commodities are. They are purchased normally uh, based on price. Um, so where do you buy your gas? For most of you, probably wherever you can find it's cheapest on the way going home. Um, you're probably not going to drive 30 minutes out of your way to go across town to buy gas cheaper, but in terms of what's convenient for you, you're going to go with the low price leader, most likely, uh, if you're like most people. So <clears throat> the question is, have, I, has, have PCs, is IT infrastructure, are LANs and WANs, are T1 and T3 lines, are, are all those commodities? Have they become commodities? <clears throat> For most companies, and the larger the company, the more likely the answer to that is yes. For most companies, um, IT infrastructure stuff is pretty much viewed as a commodity. Uh, you don't care about brand, you do care about service levels, you care about price, you care about financing, you care about um, how the help desk works, you care about, I mean, other things that you might care about, but whether it comes from Dell or whether it comes from HP or whether it comes from Lenovo, you probably don't care about that. Almost 10 years ago now, a really smart guy named Nick Carr wrote an article in the Harvard Business Review IT doesn't matter. If you haven't read it, it's probably worth going back to dig that out and read that article. Fairly lengthy, but in the article, Nick Carr, um, based on a lot of data that he presents, makes the case that IT is becoming like electricity. No one questions whether or not a modern corporation needs electricity to run. Everybody gets that that's critical to the proper operation of the corporation. But when was the last time you saw a chief electricity officer? And Nick Carr is arguing that IT is being commoditized so that we won't need a C-level person in charge of IT in the future. Uh, this is something that's just mostly going to be outsourced and you don't need a lot of senior management attention to doing that properly. Well, when, when Nick came out with that um, thesis back in 2003, there was a lot of resistance to that initially. Uh, but as, as we debated that and explored that in the community, we came to realize uh, the following was true. What we probably want to do is we want to view IT divided into two parts, not necessarily equal halves. <clears throat> We're going to have the strategic part and the tactical part. Now when we talk about the tactical part, what we mean is IT services where the focus 
is on providing reliable services, providing affordable services, and providing secure services. Now, if this is the primary focus of IT in your company, then you're back down here somewhere. Um, <clears throat> the strategic part of IT is how do we use increasingly significant parts of the IT budget to create business value? What do we mean when we say create business value? Well, basically we mean build IT systems that increase the company's profits or that increase the size of the customer base or that improve the brand. So when your CEO uses that word, by the way, this is something that's very important for CIOs to understand. When your CEO maybe comes to you and says, I want to get more value out of my IT investment, or he asks you as the CIO, what can we do to get more value out of the IT investment? He is not saying that he does not see that there's some benefit to the company in having its IT services be reliable, affordable, and secure. He knows that's true. That is not what he's talking about. That is not what he's questioning. What he's, what he's asking for is how do we do a better job than we have been doing in using the IT budget to make a bigger impact on the profits of the company, to make a bigger impact on increasing the size of the customer base, or increasing the market share of the company, or to make a bigger impact on improving the brand. And you'll note that these two really are a way to make that happen. So it all comes down to him asking the question, how can we use IT um, to more significantly increase the profits of the company than we have done in the past. That's the question he's asking. If you don't understand that's the question he's asking, you'll have no chance of answering the question properly. I've seen a lot of CIOs get sort of offended when they hear a question like that coming from their CEO because what they're hearing is that the CEO doesn't value this stuff. And that isn't what the CEO is saying at all. The CEO is asking you to become more effectively engaged <clears throat> in doing this stuff. All right, so our answer to Nick Carr and his 2003 article in the Harvard Business Review is <clears throat> a lot of this stuff will increasingly become commoditized. We see that happening already. People are moving to the cloud. People don't care what vendors they get their PCs from, or their Cat5 e-cable, or their WAPs. Um, what, that's just an evidence to say IT is being commoditized. What do you do with commodities? How do you properly manage commodities? Usually you outsource them. So sooner or later, this part of IT will increasingly become outsourced. Again, if you're moving data centers into the cloud, you're outsourcing that already. You may not have viewed it that way, but that's, that's the truth. Um, and so that the CIO's focus in the future is, is here. This is the question the CIO's got to get better at answering. How do we use the IT budget more effectively than we did last year to create more profits or grow a bigger customer base? So if we take a look at these next slides in the slide set here, um, the general consensus on the is IT a commodity debate um, is that, yep, infrastructure probably is, but 
Next slide here, the strategic business advantage that comes from innovatively employing IT is not a commodity. So what are the strategic business applications that IT is enabling or should be enabling? Um, all that sales and client data that you've collected over the years, are you doing anything with that? I mean, anything significant that's creating new value for the company that the company's never seen before? That would be a data analytics or data mining sort of a thing. Um, if you're not doing that, uh, you're becoming, you're going to lose competitive edge if your competitors are doing that. Um, the whole notion of internet marketing, sales, service strategies, etc. Now, <clears throat> we've mentioned um, that there's an increasing emphasis on getting the CIO to be better at estimating the internal rate of returns on large IT investments and then actually delivering those returns. Uh, this gives rise to new corporate governance models. Um, there's, um, there's a lot of wisdom in getting the business units to take ownership of major IT initiatives. Now, I don't mean sponsorship. A lot of people, when I say the word ownership, they think sponsorship. Nope, it's not what I mean. What I mean is that the COO is the responsible person for some new system that you're putting in place. Or that the VP of sales is the responsible senior project manager for the new CRM system. Or that the CFO is the responsible senior manager for the ERP system that you're putting in place or whatever. Um, that idea makes a lot of CIOs a little nervous, um, but it's something that you need to learn not only to get over the nervousness, but to desire it, to master it, to cultivate the ability um, to get the other business unit leaders to take ownership of the major uh, IT investments that the company is making. A lot of good reasons for doing that. We'll talk about those later in the course. And the last one here is I heard or I read um, one of the more famous influential CIO guru consultants in the country was talking about how he can tell um, when a company has a good CIO. If he's been in a room with a bunch of folks in the leadership team and he's been talking to the CIO for more than 10 minutes and he can't tell that's the CIO, then he knows that that, that person's a good CIO. So what does that mean? That means once the CIO is outside IT, he's never talking about IT. That is, that is not an appropriate topic of discussion for the CIO to have outside IT. The CIO is talking about strategic business developments. He's talking about new business initiatives. He's talking about um, understanding the customer better. He's talking about understanding what the headwinds in the marketplace are to the company adding more customers, uh, etc. Those are the topics of discussion that a uh, competitive CIO uh, needs to be engaged in uh, once, he, once he's, his feet are not planted inside the boundaries of the IT organization. So we see that the traits of a good CIO are focused more here than here. And uh, that's probably the biggest takeaway uh, from this. So CIOs, yes, they need to be familiar with technology, but they need to become expert at strategic business planning. And uh, that concludes our lecture for today. Thank you.